now we know the rest of the story. Now Tracy will now take the stage and educate us regarding distribution issues and all the other things that we need to be on top of. So okay. thank you, Tracy. Did everybody get one of these producer shares? If not, pass it on down. Yes. I gotta go get some now we <laughs> it's kind of small, no, sorry. Um, when we when we talked a couple of weeks ago, we talked about getting your script green lit to be sure it was marketable and there was a place in the worldwide marketplace. Balanced producers prepare their film for the worldwide marketplace and prepare the worldwide marketplace for their film. So you've got, we're going on the assumption that, okay, you got your development funding, the green light came through, and we said, yes, we're going to green light this. Now, this is the process that is the 18 months leading up to production. Balanced producers have the bank fund production. But the first question you always get is, yeah, but what do you use as collateral? You know, I don't get a bank loan for a house or whatever without, you know, earnest money and collateral. So the collateral are these incredibly boring paperwork contracts that have value. And that is the collateral, the aggregate of this collateral that the bank will then fund production. So the first thing you have to do, the, the, there's traditionally, the first thing you want to do and you want to get the first contract is with your U.S. distributor. And so there are three traditional contracts or relationships with U.S. distribution, with your U.S. distributors. There's the in-house production, there's the negative pickup, and there's the distribution agreement. Now there is a huge... I don't know what the word is, um, misunderstanding that studios hate independent producers. And that's baloney. Because in-house, they will only produce the tent poles and maybe nine or ten pictures of uh, films a year. All the rest of the films come from you guys. They come from independent <coughs> producers. They are set up for distribution first, production second because that's where the money is. So the idea that your big U.S. distributors don't like independent producers is, is a falsehood. Uh, you're, what, you're the blood that keeps them running. So your major studio distributors in the U.S. are Universal NBC, the Walt Disney Company in the 21st Century Fox, and yes, they did change the name to 21st Century. When Disney acquired two-thirds of Fox, it was the movie production portion in their library. They needed it to be competitive. Paramount Pictures, Sony, which is TriStar in Columbia, Warner Brothers with the WB, and Lionsgate. Those are your, key, your major U.S. distributors throughout the country. Yes, sir? And, and they're also production studios. And I thought back in the 40s there was a law that prevented the vertical integration. No, that, that was recently... They basically ignored it, let's put it that way, when they dissolved the studio system. They can't own the movie theaters, but this is the tube to distribute to the movie theaters. Now that law, and I can't remember what it was called, about a year and a half ago, yeah, about a year and a half ago, went the way of the dodo bird. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens because now distributors can buy theater chains. And it was in Va Daily Variety a couple of days ago that, was it Regal, Regal Theatres is um, looking to close most of their UK theatres and some of their US because of COVID. It wasn't the reason for that to protect the independent. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know, and to, permit, to prevent monopolies. But the thing that happened was it just made the funnel tighter that you go through these US distributors. You can go directly to the theater chains themselves in DYI, and, you know, like you said, Ma the mine was here in some of them. You do the deal directly. But if you want your ROI and you want, and you want to reach the screens and you want to reach the audience that will reimburse you and you will make some money, you've got to play with the big boys. Yeah. And the big boys want to play with you. You just, the, uh, the thing that's interesting to me when I deal with my students is it's such a mystery where the money comes from and how we have it. It's not that hard. It's just business. 
There isn't a secret handshake. There isn't a secret language. I mean, you go to AFM, you walk up to a booth, and you go, Hi, my name's Tracy. I'm from Thunder Media. I have a film I want to talk to you about. That's how you get them. Boom. Well, if I'd known it was that easy. So you also have, if you're looking at more of a niche market, not completely niche, but art house, you have Focus Features, which is out of Universal, Sony Classics and Affirm, which is out of Sony, Fox Searchlight, which is now out of Buena Vista Disney, and Fox 2000, which is out of Buena Vista. Look at those. They're doing hit films. They're doing films that are nominated for um, Globes and Oscars. Uh, and so it's a smaller audience. It's fewer screens, but they tend to go more artsy. Uh, for want of a better word. Previously, we had a copy of your uh, uh, PowerPoint here. Yeah. We can do that again. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, the definition is they are self-contained entities. They both distribute and produce. They have global theatrical and ancillary self-powers. They have global media alliances, which you're going to need if we have time to get into international distribution. And they have, here's the big one, ding, 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 ding bank, commercial, public, and equity funds. In the second and third, well, in the second deal, the negative pickup, the bank funds it based on the credit of the studio. You do the funding up front, but I have a distribution deal with Universal, and the bank will fund with your collateral your production based on the credit line of Universal. Because as soon as you deliver that film completed, they, the studio reimburses you development and production, which we'll, we'll get to in a, media, in a, in a minute. So, What's ne What does negative pickup mean? We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. That we're we're going to go through in very detail. Bio. Yeah, um, kind of. So they are very distribution focused. When I started at Disney, that year, that first year, I worked on 32 films in-house. And there was three of us. Do the math. Within three years, I was down to nine films a year in-house because the money comes through distribution, not production. And so uh, they, you get a higher profit per picture through distribution. Expenses and fees come off the top before production costs. Distribution operations can accommodate more pictures than in production. Distribution connects directly with the marketplace and costs are similar picture to picture, distribution is more stable and less risky. That, those are the reasons why they like you guys. Those are the reasons they want to distribute your film. Here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, traditionally, and I'm talking the last 20 years, uh -huh. year by year, it's been approximately 400 feature films done here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and distributed, not to mention the ones that are not distributed. Yeah. But uh, Bollywood is like five times that many. Yeah. But, but out of that hundred, roughly, out of that four hundred, uh, four hundred. I mean, yeah, uh, approximately a hundred would be tentpole studio ones, or fewer than, or that. even fewer than that. Yeah, I'd, that I'd say closer. In house, if each studio is doing, you know, let's say ten pictures in house a year, that's seventy pictures. Okay. These movie chains to stay alive and distribution to stay alive depend on the four hundred. That means there's 330 coming from somewhere that weren't made by Disney, Fox, et cetera, et cetera. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's a real misunderstanding among independent producers, small independent producers. I can't go talk to a studio. They won't talk to me. They don't like us. Are you kidding? They love you. Well, I've got a question about uh -huh. that. Um, you mentioned the same things hap that happened to us. Like we would have people come in and pitch products every yeah, Monday, yeah, maybe yeah. 25 yeah. people, or, or they'd send in a video or whatever. Mm -hmm. After a while, it was like, oh my gosh, this is so, how do we even make it through all this? <laughs> you mentioned that you had the same thing at Weinstein's company where people come in to pitch their things, yeah, every and after day. a while, it's like, oh my gosh. I have you know, heard, I there, I there's even, what, like 50 or ideas really in the through, world, you know? Yeah. yeah. It, it really got to be frustrating. Number one, they didn't know how to pitch. So like I said, they were all over the board and you had no idea what they were talking about. But yeah, I mean... You By the 20th one, you're like, oh my gosh. Get me how a many more? And not only that, you, you had to sit in the room with Harvey, which made it even worse. So, so, yeah. so if, if, if that was your case, we got these big studios and these big studios are probably inundated 
But see what they what, what, what the pitches that, and yeah what the pitches were coming to us for for the most part was they wanted in house, which I'll, I'll talk to you about in a minute. This is you contact the distribution, not production, and say, I want to do a deal, or you meet them at AFM. I've got a film. We'll make it. And yeah, and and when we in a few minutes we'll get to okay. what each one of the deal. So our trailer are. that we made, at, uh, we could take the AFM. Yeah. Because yeah. AFM, the trailer. AFM isn't happening this year. Otherwise, it's we'll be on right yeah. now. Yeah. Because you've got, and we'll, if we get to international, there's okay. like three to six uh, uh, festivals where you can meet with these salespeople. Okay. And AFM's the big one. Uh, AFM Cannes, Berlin, Toronto, Sundance, and... Tribeca. By the way, yeah, AFM yeah. is American Film Market. American Film Market. It's, ever the, it's like the first week of November every year in the Santa Monica um, Convention Center. And, and Cannes, I mean, it's a circus. <laughs> but you have sales agents there representing like 1,100 countries, something like that. Okay. Uh, so, um, but when you go in to talk to them, preparation is the key. You need to know in advance what deal points you want, where you're, will, where you're going to draw the line and say, no, past this, we're not going to negotiate further, and have those deal points reviewed with your entertainment attorney because... Legalese is a language all his own. It changes daily, and the definition of that word is not the definition of the dictionary. So you really need your entertainment attorney to look at your deal points to make sure you're covering everything you have and everything you need. And that's why I say this. It's very precise, and definitions change. A really excellent book on negotiating um, that I highly recommend before you try to negotiate anything is this wish, want, walk method, reaching agreements that work. It's a phenomenal book on negotiating. Uh, it's really, really a good book. So, you want to... Oh, what? The title was... The Wish, Want, Walk Method to Reaching Agreements that Work. You can get it on Amazon. It's really, really a good book. Um, okay, so... There are certain definitions that if we have time to get to international, we'll go through them, but you really need to know what they mean when they say net profits, gross profits, um, performing revenue, expense, distribution, waterfalls, producers net, producers gross, distribution. They're going to use very specific language they're very familiar with, and you need to become very, very familiar with it so you know what they're talking about. Now, there's three basic areas, arenas within a studio. You've got the executive er arena, uh, the distribution, which handles all the distribution, and then production, which handles in-house production. Uh, the first two deals are dealt with the production uh, arena. The third one is dealt with through distribution only. Um, so, as I said, you've got three conventional contracts with a distributor. You've got in-house production, negative pickup, and distribution only. And then there's kind of a hybrid deal that's kind of a combination between negative pickup and distribution only. So there are certain deal points that are going to be the same on all of them. Yes, sir? By the way, for those of us who are frantically trying to take notes, this video will be available. And, and I'll send the PowerPoint ahead as well. Creative control. Who owns the film negative and the copyright? <coughs> There's your mailbox money right there. And so uh, do, you, uh, do they own it all? Do you own it all? Is it a percentage? How does that work? The specifics of the theatrical distribution commitment. That gets very, very specific because you've got all four windows you're dealing with. You've got box office, you've got SVOD, you've got home entertainment, and you've got television network. And when, you're dis when I contact Paramount, for my upcoming script, I'm not just negotiating with them U.S. box office. Okay, we've got that nailed down. Now let's touch it on your, on your streaming. How are we going to distribute on your streaming? Okay, now we got that down. Now we're going to talk about home entertainment. How are we going to distribute home entertainment? Okay, we've got that down. Now let's talk about television and television syndication. How are we going to do that? You're not just talking to them about box office. And you want to make sure you hit all of them. Now, a question for you. The, uh, 
the big area for scams mm -hmm. is that area right there because the uh, distributor can say, oh, well, it really costs out of pocket so much for PMA, so much for this and that. And, uh, and if you don't have it all nailed down and yeah. auditable, yeah. You, you end up with no money with on no a money. film that made $50 million. Well, and y if you look at this sheet that I gave <coughs> you, we'll jump ahead to the sheet really quickly so you, so you can, y it'll explain as we go along. But there's kind of a rule of thumb. Like, we estimate that this was a $50 million box office growth. The first column is what the cost would be if it was an in-house in production, the second a negative pickup, and the third distribution only. But you'll see theatrical bro go gross box office. The next term says film rental, and it gives you a percentage. And, you know, the distribution fee, it gives you the percentage for all three. So when you go in, you know rule of thumb based on our green light analysis, we determined that the U.S. box office is going to be, you know, 50, 60 million dollars. Let's say 60 million dollars. So that means that the film rental is going to be 50 percent of that. I already know going in, they're not going to look at me and go, oh no 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 no, we're talking 75 percent. Hmm. No, it's 50 percent. You nail it down. You've already got your percentages. And again, it's assumptions based on the green light analysis, but we have these assumptions and all that paperwork that I showed you a month ago is pretty, pretty solid depending on how you, the distributor, <laughs> market the sucker. So we're going to talk to you about that. So you know in advance what these percentages are and what they should be based on what our assumptions are. So if they come out and they say, well, no, that's 45% fee, no, actually, it's 32. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll, you know, try to jerk your chain, but you know you're dealing with a professional up front when you're dealing with these studios because they do these deals all the time. And that's what I'm saying. You need to know your deal points because you need, they, they will respect that you know what you're doing. And so I, I'm prepared. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm anticipating and expecting. Um, and so, you know, they're not going to say, now, do you want to talk to me about streaming? They're planning on streaming that sucker. <laughs> they're expecting you to know what you're doing. And they expect you to track your contracts. I mean, you know, COVID knocked everything out of the bat. I, I might have had a deal with Universal and we were going to release at this point, and we were going to release streaming at this point, we were going to, um, everything just went into the top hat. Universal's not going to pick up the phone and call you and go, okay, let's discuss your contract. No, you pick up the phone and you contact them. Okay, let's discuss my contract. How is this altering things? Because, uh, you know, you want to make money off it, but so do they. So the negotiations have to be in that respect. Um, a quick aside, you asked about negative pickup. Um, it means negative, like film negative, what went through the camera, meaning uh, the purchase of the, uh, of the actual, actually the edited negative, remember mm -hmm. back then? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that's the purchase of it. And that, and so if you go out and you uh, buy uh, a $500 video camera and go out and into the forest and make a little thing about Blair Witch or something, you know, and then you go back and, and uh, want a refund on the camera, so you get your money back off of that, and you put uh, all of fifty fifty thousand dollars into this, and then you go off and uh, negotiate. Yeah. Somebody comes and says, "I'll give you a million dollars for this film." You're thrilled at that. They just bought it, everything, the board. all of it, and they went out and made forty million. Yeah. So that's a negative pickup if you're willing to. And we'll go into the deal points, like right, what we're about to talk to now, in-house studio production. Okay. Basically, that's what it says. They're going to make it in-house. They're going to produce it in-house. Uh, it's through the production er arena, and what you, the producer, do is you provide an acceptable story plus the capacity to complete, develop, and deliver a finished picture on schedule and within budget. So in American English, I've got a script. We're ready to make this film. If we do it in-house, then we, I will make sure it gets pushed through development on time and on schedule, uh, production on time and on schedule, and it will be delivered. And the studio then provides all the development and production support. 
the financial and business resources to complete the picture, and all the distribution resources to sell the rights. So what it comes down to is you get a film and a producer's credit. But hey, you got a film and a producer's credit. There ain't nothing wrong with that. That's the way to build a career. And so that is the deal. Now the caveat is they'll tell you you have creative freedom. Baloney, there's no such thing. Because the ultimate creative control is in the studio sense because they're paying for everything. And so they own the negative, not you, you don't even own a percentage of it. They own the copyright and the royalties, you don't have any percentage of it. You are paid a fee to produce this film. You're hired help. You're hired help, and we will give you a producer's credit on it. And there's nothing wrong with that, but if you look down on your, your sheet here on your producers, your studio relationship, out of a $50 million film, your producer's net is $2,200,000. Well, that's not bad. That's more than I had when I started. But then, you know, as we go along, you, stand, you can make a lot more. So basically on that deal, everything's done in-house, and you get a credit in the film. And it's a good way to get your career started. Now, the negative pickup is the one you most often see in Hollywood. Once again, you, the producer, provide the story and the capacity to complete the development and finished picture under budget and, you know, on budget and on schedule. They will provide production support, a bankable contract for all or a portion of production funds to be paid upon delivery of the film. So now you need so to you're ref they are refunding you the negative cost of the film. So you are responsible for getting all this collateral and going to the bank and getting the funding. The license right for the global U.S. or international distribution, all that is negotiated, and that's one of those things that you need to know before going in where you're going to draw the line. Okay, at this point, no. Now, the bank contract states that the studio will pay an agreed-upon amount when the film is delivered plus royalties. So you're funding up, up front the development, you're funding up front the production, you might be funding part of the, the you know, distribution uh, and, and license rights. You deliver the CRI or the final negative, they will refund you that. And in the contract it states they will receive it on this date and they will give you this amount. Um, so you have to do everything up front and you get it at the back. Now here's again the caveat. You have a little more creative freedom than you did with the in-studio, uh, but the studio may have the right to the final cut. They have the right to what? The final cut of the film. Or they might have really, really tight control over the script, the producer, the talent, and that can be challenging. You have top five actors that you want to cast in the lead role. But they have a three-picture deal with so-and-so. So they really want you to use so-and-so. Well, I want to, you know, these are who I want to do. Well, your contract states you're going to deliver that film on August 1st, 2021 or 2022. We can only argue about talent so long before I hit a wall and I have to go, okay, crap, I've got to use so-and-so. And they will do that. They will strong-arm you on that if they feel real strongly about how tight they want the creative control. Now, you typically own the copyright. Mailbox money. And the studio will receive the distribution rights. The gross receipts collected by the studio. The studio has paid its distribution fee for all rights it sells to where it's going to distribute throughout the world. And it recoups the direct distribution expenses. DVEs become a huge negotiating point. And may also have points on the picture. Now DVEs can basically rule of thumb publicity and marketing, picture delivery and marketing is two-thirds your budget. So if your budget is $60 million or $6 million, then your distribution fees, your DVEs, are going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $40 million. So are they going to cover that? Are you going to cover that? And you think, well, what does that cover? 
Okay, think of every, everything that you market, all your campaign. Last time you walked in Geneva, you had all those pop-up and stand-ups and videos going, and they had an inflatable King Kong that you could get your picture in front of. You know, all, Those are all BDEs. Who's going to pay those? And when you get into your foreign territories, and you've, get, you've decided you want to market in eight of the 14 territories, are you going to dub the language? Are you going to subtitle it? Oh, gee, in China they have how many different freaking dialects? And India. Oh. And India? Okay. And a large portion of your audience might be illiterate, so they can't read the subtitles, so we have to, sub we have to you know, dub it in five dialects. Or Those are DDE costs. Um, you know, the actors don't show up on Jimmy Kimmel because they like Jimmy Kimmel. They get paid to do that because they're marketing the film. Those are DDEs. So who is going to cover that? It used to be called P and A. Yeah, it it's still called P and A, but when you're right. talking about the expenses, they cut it down to direct distribution uh, expenses, and they just call them DDEs. But yes, yeah, P and A, picture delivery and marketing, or publicity and uh, or advertising, or publicity and advertising. Now you, the producer, deliver to the studio access. Notice that access because uh -huh. who owns the copyright? You do. You do access to the negative or the CRI and all the campaign materials, the marketing materials that they told you in the original contract that they need to market this film. You know, those, those making of interviews, those photos on set, those yada da yada da yada da. All of which have to be factored into your shooting schedule and your shooting budget. Now, yeah, it might be second unit or third unit, but they get paid to shoot that, and it has to be scheduled in the schedule. And every foreign territory, when you sign the pre-sale agreement, gives you a manila envelope, or now you get a disc, that says everything they expect you to deliver with the film on the marketing campaign. Okay. Editor, they're called deliverables. Yeah, they're deliverables. They're called deliverables. Thank you. You've got it. You gotta give them. You, yeah, you gotta it's, get it to them. You, it's contracted that you deliver yeah. that at such and such a date. Yeah. Okay. So again, and here's the real, truly frustrating thing: out of 14 major foreign territories, every one of them wants something different. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it would be really nice if they'd get together and agree on a package. But Germany wants this, and Italy wants that, and Russia wants that, and don't talk to China; it'll give you a headache. And it, it, You'll get a helps. list from every different every, every different thing. Every different territory. So, yeah, this is what you have to deliver with the CRI. And some of it has to be delivered in advance because they're starting the press releases and they're starting the P&A in advance of the release. Yes? For those that don't, that don't know what a color reversal interrogative is. Yeah. It's the negative of the film. DCP is what it would be now. Yeah, for yeah. The most part. Digital cinema. Uh, yeah, the the day of having to mail huge reels of film or deliver huge reels of film, and I can just shoot it through the internet. It's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so the picture will contain the pre pre approved above the line talent, director, principal cast, and you deliver there. Now the funding, one of the five entertainment banks, whichever one that the distributor particularly really, really likes lends you the production funding based on the studio's credit line because I have a signed distribution deal with Universal, which means this film is going to be made, they're going to pay it back. So you still have to get all the collateral together. You still have to get all of these contracts together. You still do the pre-sales and the pre-advancements. That's the collateral that you take to the bank. But they, they take the collateral into account. You definitely need it, and you need the bond, but they, ba they, they do the loan based on Universal's credit line or Disney's credit line or whoever's credit line. Um, you have the bank and completion bond relationship. You're the one who sets it all up. That's just why they, why they add that into the decision-making process. Um, so the collateral is the combination of your studio distribution deal, your pre-sale agreements with all of the foreign territories that you're doing, uh, the unsold territories estimated for the value, your contracts with your director, your lead actor, your contracts with Doubleday Book, who's going to turn it into a novel or re-release the novel with your one sheet on the front, 
Uh, okay, we're distributing this through Sony, and Sony Music is going to do the soundtrack. All of these contracts have value, and some of them, all the foreign pre-sales, have advanced money to you. They, they, they advance you 10 to 20 percent of their fee, their distribution fee for their territory. So all of this is the collateral. You might be going in for a $20 million loan or a $10 million loan, and you already have $3 million in the bank from your pre-sales in foreign territories. This is the collateral, the aggregate of all this collateral that the bank then funds your production. Now, you also have to have um, the completion bond. $2 million dollars or more, it needs to be completed. The bank won't talk to you without the completion bond. And we talked about them a little bit last time. Uh, they're your friends. Make that agent on your advisory board. Have that agent one of your references. And you need, e yes, sir? Back when I was in LA, there was a, an LDS guy who was on the major completion bond. Uh -huh. Do you know? I can't remember his name. Probably There's two it. companies now, and I can't remember what they are, but I, I can look them up and I can send them to you. There's two completion bond companies now, and all they do is completion bonds which is a good and a bad thing. I mean, number one, there's only two of them, <laughs> but they know what they're doing. They, they know who's insurable and who's not insurable. They, 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 they can look at it and go, I'm sorry, no, you can't make that film on that budget. Trust me, you've got to rework the budget. I mean, they can tell at a glance. So, um, also, they would be looking at who you have as yeah. producing, directing. Yeah, well. the talent all yeah. has to be bonded. Who's attached? Who's attached to it? Um, I remember talking to Charlton Heston. He, they, he had one of the lowest insurance rates in the industry before he died because he had never missed a day of work mm -hmm. in his entire career. Only once did he get sick on a set. He was telling me this on True Life. It was on Planet of the Apes because he was wearing a loincloth the whole time and he caught a chill. <laughs> and he got, a head, he got a really bad cold and he lost his voice. Uh -huh. But he lost his voice shooting the days where his character didn't speak. <laughs> and when he spoke for the first time, take your filthy paws off me, you damn dirty beast, it's really hoarse. <laughs> that was the first he'd spoken in like three weeks. He said that wasn't acting. That was really trying to get his voice out. <laughs> but he, he had one of the lowest insurance rates in the industry because they knew he was going to be there on time, he was going to be healthy, he was going to be prepared, and they didn't need to worry about it. Did, did, did they clean up the dialogue in ADR? ADR? I, I don't know. I did, you know. Maybe it looked good that he found it. Yeah, good. he really yeah. found it. it was very hey, we good. have a big advantage right now in the COVID era. Just yeah. shoot yeah. with yeah. the yeah. mask on. And ADR is simple. But he, he swears it's because he was wearing a loincloth. Um, so, and then E&O insurance protects you from libel. And you have to have errors and omission insurance for $2 million or more. And and it's not just, well, you know, that's my script. You know, that's my story idea. You stole it from me. Uh, L.A. Confidential. Did I tell you this story? Brilliant film. L.A. Confidential. Hard R. You shouldn't have seen it. Uh, the opening sequence is set in the late 1950s, early 1960s in L.A. And the opening sequence, they pan the office of the L.A. District Attorney's Office. Well, the prop man did what every good prop man does. He goes to the prop warehouse and he checks out everything he needs. And he checked out all these photos to put on the credenza behind the desk, family photos from late 1950, early 1960. They, did, they were doing some sort of preview, preview audience and a member of the audience recognized a photo there as a photo of their family. And they didn't want their family in that picture. They stopped the release of the film to reshoot every shot that had that, that picture in it. Now, E&O Insurance paid for it. They were covered. They were insured. But it can be something as irritatingly simple as that. So it protects filmmakers from lawsuits, for theft of idea, yeah. copyright, libel, slander, invasion of privacy, yada, 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 yada. It is required for distribution deals with studios, television, cable network, DVD, and internet sites. Okay, that's all four of your windows. So you have to have it. So even if, even if you're under two million? If you're two million or... It's not, it's not bad to have it if you're under two million, but it's required for two million or more. 
just like completion bond is required for television. I have it for TV stuff and for even yeah, TV movies. Yeah, for television. Yeah. Distribution, you got to have it. You just buy a $2 million policy. You're not, you're not putting in $2 million. No, you're you're buy, it's like a, a you know, house yeah. insurance or whatever. It's a, it's a now, the thing, you have to factor these into your budget because, like any insurance policy, the minute you sign that insurance policy, you're paying on the policy. So that has to be factored into right. your budget. Right. And you have to think about that. So you have that. Now your distribution only relationship is pretty much what it says. It's entered in through, through the distribution arena and oddly enough even though it's only distribution it's the most sophisticated of them all. You've really got to be careful of your negotiating points. You provide the finished picture, developed, produced, financed and in some instances depending on your contract with them part or all of the DDEs. So the negative cost of my film was six million dollars. Well, no, your DDEs are additional four million. Oh, okay, you know. And this is this is the hybrid deal. Now, your studio's distribution unit, production and campaign consulting form from the earliest development. This theatrical distribution is the first contract you get as part of your collateral. And it's kind of happening at the same time you're talking to your director or your, you know, your, your candidates for director. Um, because you start talking to these distributors or these foreign territory pre-sales and the first thing you get is, uh, okay, who's attached to it? Well, we haven't attached anybody to it because we're trying to get a distributor. You contact your director and your director goes, okay, so who are you distributing through? <laughs> It's all a catch-22. Yeah, it's a catch-22. Yeah, yeah. So that's why it becomes, we are, and you're not lying, I'm talking to them. I'm talking to these five directors. They're all very, very interested. They're available. These are their fees. They're just waiting for us to get a little further into the relationship. The same thing you're saying to your director. Well, I'm talking to Universal and Paramount, and we're talking to them about a negative pickup deal. We're talking to them about this, 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 that, and the other thing. Notice I didn't say I have a signed contract with them. But we're talking to them. And many of them, their agents will say, who's got creative control? Because they want to know if you're going to run into problems. I've got so-and-so attached, but the studio is saying, i got to go with you. And so, you know, you've got to be careful of that. Now, are letters of intent bankable? Yeah, yeah, they are. Are they yeah. collateral? Letters yeah, they coll they're good collateral. But by the time you go in to get that bank loan, you should have signed contracts. Oh, okay. You should definitely have signed contracts. Um, I mean, you should get your U.S. distributor signed within six to eight months. They're not going to sign your first meeting. Nine times out of ten, they're not even going to act like they're interested. <laughs> it's going to be, you know, six months down the line before you finally nail down that contract. Your ter foreign territory pre-sales can take a year or more because you're talking to so many of them, number one. Uh, but you're at the same time getting your director, getting your actors, you know, getting your above the line, that thick, thick black line. Um, so the, the caveat is the producer is going to consult with these distributors throughout development and production of the film because you're license bound, you are contractually bound to deliver the picture that I told them you were going to get. You know, uh, major rewrites or anything, you gotta, you got to keep everybody in the loop. So, but the really nice thing about that distribution only is you own everything. You own the copyright. You own the distribution rights. You own the license distribution rights to global media. The studio will pay a fee for distribution, and they'll take points on the gross. That's how they make their money. So you've got that. The studio, from the gross receipts collected, the studio's paid distribution fee, which is which go to and it tells you what, here what the percentage is. I think it's 35%, 50%. 50%. And then recoups any direct uh, DDEs that they put in, and they'll have points. You get everything else after everything else is paid off. And if you look at your sheet here, if you look down at the bottom, if you did an in-house production, the producer shares 2,200,000. If I do a distribution only deal with that studio, my share as producer off a $50 million box office, once you add in 
your foreign territories and all of your four different windows everywhere is 40 million 500,000. That's a huge difference because it comes down to who's paying when, who's paying what, and who's reimbursing and who owns. That's the difference in those. Now, there's, uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't thumb my nose at two million two hundred thousand, but forty million is a whole lot better than two million. So it all depends on who owns what. Now, Question. yes, sir. You don't have, uh, if you're uh, just distribution only, you don't have the negative pickup guaranteed to take to the bank. Mm -mm. It's collateral. It's you collateral. Have other collateral. I have. It's not. It, the, the, they'll still look at the loan and go, oh, okay, you've got a distribution only with with Universal. And that's like collateral. Too. But that's that's part of the collateral. But they don't really look at the studio's credit line on that. Yeah. They go, you're making the film. They're just distributing it. Yeah. So your collateral. You want to look at that collateral, and hopefully you don't have any gap funding that you still need to do. So that's the difference there. Uh, because what happens is they know on the negative pickup they're going to get their money back because it's refunded at delivery of the picture. Um, on a distribution only, they start getting their money back as the box office rolls in. So there's your difference there. But you know, independent uh, uh, when you look at ticket sales, your major studios generate with their tent poles in theory about 90% of the box office. Okay, that leaves 10% for you guys. But that 10% in the past years has totaled over a billion dollars. There's market place for you. And they know that. Uh, and then if you decide you want to go really independent, um, you have much smaller independent theatrical distributors you can talk to as well. Much fewer screens, but that doesn't negate the success they've had. Um, Magnolia Pictures, uh, World's Fastest Indian, brilliant little film, starring Anthony Hopkins, really, really good film. Roadside Attractions, which is now owned by 45% by Lionsgate. Open Road, A24 did Lady Bird, which was nominated for some awards. Uh, Broad Green Pictures, Bleecker Street. These are your much smaller independent distributors and they independent they, they distribute independent of your major studios and it, they will do the same deals with they will do distribution only with you some of them will even do negative pickups um, but there it's an option there to, if you want to go smaller are these mini majors or mini minors they would be considered okay. well your mini majors are new are, are in studio Miramax oh, okay. new line so focus features like these are many miners outside major studios. Many miners. Yeah. And I was at Miramax when um, New Line did the trilogy. And the year before it opened, the scuttlebutt was, oh my gosh, it is going to fail. And everything is so incestuously connected financially in the industry. Then all the mini majors were going to go down with New Line, and it was going to be New Line's fault. I mean, that was that was the <laughs> that was the conversation for a year. But what trilogy? The the, tri the Lord of the Rings trilogy, oh. and then the first one opened, and and you know New Line went na 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 na, and we all looked at each other in meetings and went, I never said it was going to be a failure, did you? <laughs> yeah. No snake eyes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right, definition. Gross box office, GBO. Film rental, now here's where you get some of your percentages. Share of the GBO to the distributor, common rule of thumb, 50% to distributor, 50% to exhibitor. Here's how many screens you've got at some of these big guys. So your film rental there is 50%. Uh, your theatrical distribution fee is 35% of, or 20 to 35% of the film rental, 50%. So you know in advance, based on your green light analysis, the assumption of the numbers, you can reverse engineer. So you know where you should stand. Uh, direct distribution expenses, so we talked about that. Picture delivery, 1 million to 2,500 screens with a delivery, a secure delivery. All of these fees you'll see listed on here, you need to know what they are when you go in to negotiate with people. You need to know what they mean. 
DDE's campaign creation, promotion publicity, exchange of hard drives, material costs, cost of going to festivals, etc. And then you've got your, distribu your distributor's theatrical net. And so your net and your gross are different. $50 million GBO, the typical picture, is still eight numbers away from recouping its DDEs. I said this earlier. When you release to U.S. box office through one of these big distributors on a lot of screens, less than 3% of your target audience will see your movie. It's not until it hits television will the vast majority of your target audience see your movie. Now, streaming is changing that because of COVID. We don't have the numbers on that yet. But you need that theatrical release to build the momentum, but you're not going to recoup your costs out of the theatrical release unless you're in the Marvel Universe. Um, so you've got that. Home entertainment definitions. Your home entertainment gross income. Uh, that's DVD, Blu-ray purchases, rentals, etc. That number is diminishing because of streaming, but you still have your, your I mean for Christmas, I bought my dad, it was a gift package, I found it online, 50 years of Disney films. And I think there was 25, 30 films in there from original animation to, you know, live action, etc. It was 60 bucks. So you're going to see these packaging to keep this home entertainment alive. Um, and so, I mean, for that, uh, um, you know, my dad loves Disney cartoons and all those films he grew up with, and so I knew he'd love that gift. For 60 bucks, I had to buy it. It was one of those, you can't not, you know. <laughs> but you're going to see that more and more in your home entertainment. Um, so you've got your VOD releases beginning as early as one week. Depending on the kind of audience they anticipate, you can even see VOD start on the day it's released in the box office. And they have proven in the past three years that that does not take away from the box office growth. That's mm -hmm. a big change from what it used it's to be. It's a big change. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, it, it, a lot of, sometimes that just has to do with geography. Before Mom died and Dad came up with me, they have a ranch outside Canab. All right, the nearest movie theater is Santa, is St. George. That's 90 miles away. You want to see a two-hour film, that's an hour and a half drive, two-hour film, and an hour and a half drive back. I learned not to ask Dad, have you seen this yet? <laughs> I mean, he would just blow his top over that discussion. So, you know, that, that streaming and these DVDs, for them it was location and geography. And so sometimes it comes down to that. This segment's distribution fee is negotiable, but it's usually 35% in-house, 30% negative pickup, and 25% distribution only. So you've got that. Um, then you have your duplication and distribution expenses on your home entertainment and your distributor's home entertainment net. Premium gross, premium cable, HBO, Cinemax, Showtime, Movie, Stars, Encore, those are the ones you pay for. I don't, I'm cheap. Twice a year, you can get stars free for a week because they want you to sign up. I watch stars free for a week, and then I wait six months and watch stars free for a week again. <laughs> um, so, but it follows the audience tune-in, which covers your premiere. The license of the premiere of the picture with a $50 million growth should be about 9.5% of your box office growth. So you know that when you're negotiating this. And then you have your network television, NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, CW, CNN, TNT, USA, Lifetime, Spike. Most of those are oh, owned. So you were saying 9 million? 9.5, 9.5%. So, so that's, 50, the, the, the that's, fee that's the fee. Give you yeah. For, okay. Yeah. That's the fee on that that has to come out of the gross. A lot of these are now owned by studios. So when you're doing a deal with Universal, we are also going to talk about NBC. When are you going to show this on NBC? I think they also own Showtime. They own one of them. I don't remember what. So many of these have gone, so many of your windows have gone in-house that it just becomes part of the negotiation. And so you've got that. You've got your licensed income for free television and the television premiere. Uh, and so all of those expenses. Now, your sales agent fee. When you are doing foreign territories, and if we have time to get over to, to foreign territories, I talk about this quite a bit. 
you are going to want to hire a sales agent from a sales agency to help you with the foreign territories. There are two agencies in Hollywood that all they do is foreign pre-sales, which tells you they know what they're doing. They know the game. Now, if you want to, you can go to AFM or CAMS or one of these and hit every one of your territories individually and tear your hair out and still end up with what you want. Or you can hire a sales agent and they will deal with the foreign territories and they will negotiate for you for the foreign territories. And you can go with them and, and sit in on the negotiations or you can let them handle it. it these are the six foreign territories. We have. And they'll go talk to, they know who's distributing in Germany and how to deal with them. They know who's distributing in the UK and how to deal with them. They know who's distributing here and how to deal with them. And so uh, you've got your, your sales agency and then your international territory gross and your total distributors net and your production financing expense. And these are all down here on this list as you go down. It might not be in order, but they're all there. Negative cost, the studio burden, the producer's growth, all of these definitions, talent participation, uh, you know, if, you, if you're getting your actors uh, and they want points on the growth, how do you negotiate that? And a lot of them do, a lot of them don't. You know, depends on, like I told you, George Clooney in the last 15 years, 9 out of 10 films, he did at day rate. And half of them he didn't want points on. He just wanted to play. He just wanted to be in the movie. So, um, you know, how are you going to negotiate talent participation? And the producer's net and the studio share. And then your producer share. All of these are listed as you go along. Now, from here on out, the first question everybody wants to know when you deal with them throughout the rest of your development process is who are you distributing to? Who's your, who's your distributor? That's why this has to be the first contract in your arsenal of, uh, of the, the um, collateral because there's, this is your biggest contract covering all four windows and you're going to go from there and build from there because the next thing that you want to you you want to ask is I'll get out of this. Oh, I'm not sure. Um, okay, Universal, we now have a distribution agreement for U.S. Let's talk about your arms in the rest of the, the rest of the world. Do you have contacts in the U.K.? Do you have contact? These are the seven foreign territories we're looking at. Which one of those do you have contacts in? Which one of those do you distribute through? Okay, now we've talked about box office distribution. Let's talk about what it's going to cost to stream in France. Let's talk about... They might have... You might be able to do one-stop shopping with Universal. We've got these foreign four foreign territories covered. The other three... Well, can you open doors for us on those other three? Yeah? Awesome. But they're not going to look at you and say, now, did you want to talk about <coughs> Germany before you leave? <laughs> they expect you to know what is going on and to know where you want to go from there. Because the next very, very important um, deal, uh, contracts that you, you do are the contracts for the foreign territories and the foreign pre sales And I have an entire other PowerPoint on that, which we can go through. We can go through it another time. In many respects, it's similar, but in many respects, it's a lot more complex. But those, your U.S. distribution and your foreign territory distribution, your contracts for all four windows in every one of those territories is a huge chunk of your collateral that you take to the bank to get the funding. Now, here's the byproduct of that, guys. You're still a year away from pre-production, and guess what? your worldwide distribution is already contractually in place. You don't have to worry about it. You're already covered. You know when and where it's releasing and how. Uh, now, all I have to do is get the rest of the collateral, take that, you know, sign the actor, sign the crew, do a location, do all these contracts and whatnot, and take this collateral to the bank, and you go into pre-production and production and post, you're not scrambling going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we've got to go talk to Universal, we've got to go talk, how are we going to distribute this, how's anybody going to, because it was taken care of two years ago. 
You don't need to look at your partner and go, um, have you contacted Sundance? Can we uh, submit this for Sundance? <laughs> Maybe they'll acquire it. Less than 3% of films submitted to Sundance are accepted. 0.85% of the, that 3% are acquired and distributed. What was that number again? 0.85%. So if you're thinking, well, that's all right, we can submit it to these film festivals and we'll, we'll get it that way, <coughs> buy a lottery ticket. The odds are better. Now, it's not to say it doesn't happen. It obviously does every year. But those are the odds you're looking at. The purpose of a film festival, which I go into in, when I talk about foreign territories, is to do these pre-sale contracts. That's where all these agents from the, uh, the rest of the world come. That's why they come. They don't come to watch films. They come to meet with you guys to do deals on distributing your films. Yeah. I've got a bank question. Okay. So there's a lot of similarities. Like when we do a product, <coughs> we have to get funding in order to put it in all the Walmart and everybody else. Uh -huh. It costs a lot of money to make hundreds of thousands of units of something that costs X amount per unit. Yeah, yeah. And Walmart doesn't pay till 90 days after they receive it, so you're yeah. floating a bunch of money. Yeah. But every bank that I've ever dealt with won't give us 100% of the funding based on the Walmart contract. Yeah. They'll do partial funding based on the Walmart contract, but then you've got to have physical collateral like this building or this land mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. they want because they don't they won't give you all the money based the money. on a contract. But when you're doing a distribution through the studio, one of the things you're talking about is home entertainment. They're the ones with the relationships with Walmart. They're the ones with the relationships with Amazon. And that right, different right, so fee becomes part of the DDEs, part of the distribution fees. Contracts are, you know, non-tangible, so let's say. Yeah, yeah. Will a bank, you know, if you need yeah, two million dollars the contracts, for film, the contracts have a value to them. According to our assumptions, we're going to make fifty million dollars in the U.S. in in the U.S. box office. We add in the foreign box office, just box office, and we expect to make one hundred and twelve million dollars. The value of that, even if you say, okay, let's put the value of that at fifty percent. 50% of the assumed co of the assumed immediate return is 60 million is 60 million. I'm asking for a 20 million dollar loan. But it's still an intangible. But it's still an intangible. And, and they, they, the banks won't say, well, I want some sort of tangible. Show not, me a building. Not if you've got. What about your house? Yeah. Not if you've got that contract signed in that studio behind you. That's why negative pickup is such a really good deal. Distribution only, yeah, we stand to make a lot of money, um, but negative pickup, that collateral, that loan is based on the studio's credit line, not yours. Now, you're talking about banks that know this stuff. That's, what, that's why yeah. you that go to those five, in it, those five banks right. that have right. entertainment right. divisions, mm -hmm. and all those divisions do is loan money for films. So they know the film industry as well as your completion bond companies do. Seems like if I was a bank, I would, you know, with the high failure rate on, mm -hmm. on movies, I'd be like, okay, I'll loan you some money, but I want some physical. Yeah. I want, I want some real estate. I want something. So if this thing goes south, I at least get some money. And that, back. Yeah, and that's why oh the negative God, deal man. is so good because it's it's based on Universal's credit line and what they own, not your credit line and what you own. And, and that's a whole different ballgame. That's why negative pickup is such a good deal when it comes to financing. And you've got that collateral. Foreign pre-sales, every one of those foreign territories that you sign comes with an advance, a 10 to 20% per, 20, 10 to 20% advance of what their anticipated box office and their fee is. So you might sign with the UK and, and you get an advance of $1.5 million. And you then might sign with France and get an advance of $500,000. And then you might sign with Germany, and each one of those pre-sales has an advance payment on it. That goes into the bank. You could end up with $5, 6000000 $6 million in the bank already from those pre-sales. That's also collateral. But it also says, well, my budget just went from $15 million to $7 million that I need to get from the bank. 
I don't need to get 15 million because I already got six. And so it, it, it starts adding up. That's why you want to deal with those banks that have the entertainment division. They know the ri And no matter which way you split it, you're absolutely right, and they all know this. This is a high-risk loan. But you're not going to lose your house because your house isn't part of the collateral. Your collateral is the, student's cre the studio's credit line and all the value of this, these commitments and these assumptions. Did they charge a lot of interest? Uh, it's got to, the high yeah. risk nature of it? It's a high risk. I mean, you're not going to get charged 18%, but, but it's going to be a little higher than your mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and they know too that I'm coming to you and we're still a year and three months out from it being released. Because I've still got to get through pre-production, production, post, and distribution. So you're not going to see a, an ROI for a year and a half. And they know that. That's why those banks with their entertainment divisions are the players you want to play with. They know the high risks. They know how the system works. Where, you know, you go to Zion's Bank, it's a great bank, but they're going to look at you and go, they're, they're going to start, you're going to have to educate them from get-go, and by the time you get finished with the education process, they're going to look at you and go, my mom raised one dumb kid, and that was my sister, not me, so no. no. <laughs> yeah. But you've got, you've got these entertainment divisions that do this all the time and know what's going on. Now, you know, again, COVID has changed things. Production has stopped. Money has gone back into escrow because everything has stopped. you got money floating out there doing nothing. That's the worst thing money can do. But n nobody's come up with a solution to how, you know, some production has started up again. But this, you know, you hear all the time, yeah, production has started again in L.A. No, it hasn't. I mean, some of it has, but I'd say it's only at about 30% of what it normally would be. So, you know, and the banks know that. So I still have, I'm still a little confused about something, because if I make a loan with, so if I'm a bank and one out of 20 movies is successful and 19 out of 20 fail, mm -hmm. I'm going to be really alarmed by that. It's high risk. Now, if, if I go and do a deal with the bank, I have all these contracts. Uh -huh. The loan is with me. It's with the production not, it's company. It's not with Universal. Universal's not going to be paying back the loan. It's me that's going to be paying Unless back the, the loan. Unless it's the negative pickup. They, 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 they will reimburse you a set amount. I'm going to the bank and I am loan and I am getting a loan for you know six million dollars. With interest and points, I'm going to end up paying back ten million dollars. So your contract with Universal is they will pay you $10 million on August 1st, 2021 when you deliver whatever it is you're committed to delivering. Then you pay $10 million to the bank, which pays the loan and the interest in points. And you don't have to be paying monthly? In uh, it depends on the contract. You, you know, Because you're brand new and nobody's heard of you, you they might have you paying through the whole process. If you were Imagine Films and you're, you, you know, or you're, you're Bruckheimer, or so Jerry Bruckheimer, they're going to go, okay, yeah, we know you can deliver. Um, so it comes down to that as well. But there's no negating the fact that it is high risk and the numbers we're giving you are assumptions. But we're also looking at ancillary markets that are going to pay off down the road. I mean, guys, Princess Bride bombed. Mm -hmm. The Princess Bride was successful in the box office in Utah and Idaho. The rest of the country could have cared less about the Princess Bride. They thought it was the dumbest thing since, you know, deep fried dill pickle. Uh -huh. And they just were not in the least bit interested. Within five years of its release through the ancillary market, it had become a huge cult classic. So, you know, if you look at their original box office, yeah, The Princess Bride was an absolute failure. You're not looking at the whole picture. That's why these entertainment divisions know to look at the whole picture. When we look at the ancillary, and we look at all four windows in the U.S., and we look at all four US windows in the U.K., and we look at all four windows, we're looking at these numbers. Now, it might take three to five years before we start seeing the turnaround, but it's going to, it, you know, it, it'll clear. It, the same with Secondhand Lions. Great film, great little film, love that film, bombed in the box office. 
in the ancillary market, it's become a cult classic. So what yeah, happens you if you're, you're doing a film, you've got a year of production, uh, pre uh, pre-production, production, and you've got, well, you've got 18 months before you, uh, yeah. you get that 10 million from Universal or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So in the meantime, you've got to pay every single month and something goes wrong. Well, I wonder if you, know, you get to the end and Universal says, this is terrible, this is not what we agreed Nothing to Nothing in that conjo as long as you're delivering contractually what you said you would deliver, Nothing in that contract says you have to like the movie. Nothing <laughs> in that contract says you, you think that this is the neatest, this is so entertaining. I contractually delivered what I said I would deliver. This, 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 and this. Here it is. That's why some of them want, you know, script approval or final cut approval or whatever. Um, but nothing in there says anything about the quality, just the quantity of what I turned in. So if you don't like this film, you're still marketing it and it's selling it based on this contract. And this is how much money you're putting into the marketing, and this is where you're marketing, and this is your target audience, yada, 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 yeah. yada. Yeah. So it, 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 I worked on so many films that, you know, I thought the finished product was garbage. I mean, I worked on a Spike Lee that was NC-17. I still haven't seen it. I went to the premiere, walked in, bought popcorn, walked out, took the, ta cast, uh, the taxi back to the hotel. But um, it, nothing in there said the quality of the, qu of the content. You, men you mentioned the assumptions for um, these ancillary um, markets. Yeah. And I think last time you said home entertainment is probably 35% of box office. Yeah, yeah. What is a premium cable? Um, I'd have to look it up. It's on, it's, uh, I think it's on here, right? I think it's on here. Oh my gosh, it's so tiny. How could anybody <laughs> read that? And these aren't my readers. Premium classes. cable? You gotta read yeah, the premium fine cable. Print. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 3.7. <laughs> yeah, so it's 4.5 percent on a negative pickup of the gross box office. Okay, and the, and, and the uh, home entertainment though is. Uh, well, so can uh, can anybody read that? It's so tiny. Yeah, the airline. Are these numbers on here? You're li uh, over right here into the first Larry. column, where it says. International, it says, uh, um, these aren't my reading glasses, these are my computer glasses. Home entertainment is like one, two, three down from the top, and it gives you a, a percentage on the, the fee and, and, and how to figure that. Where's the airline? Home and entertainment. And, and network television. Ancillary. How much is that? Ancillary. 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 Yeah. Um, the network television. That's right underneath. That's right underneath it's, that. It's about... It's you're just subtracting from the... Yeah, mm -hmm. so your assumption that you're building off of is the assumed U.S. box office. Right. So if we assume the U.S. box office is going to be 60 million, then home entertainment is 35% of the, the so film it's, sale. it's 7 million out of yeah. 50 million. Yeah, yeah. And that, those are the assumptions at this point. Now, it could completely take off and be more than that. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. And, and it could be less. That they're willing. These are industry assumptions. Industry, yes. Right. I've been noticing lately. I've, cause I've been looking at the box office on, on IMDb. They'll give you the box office of domestic yeah. and, foreign. and foreign. I've been noticing that foreign is sometimes now almost. Your foreign, your foreign territories combined are seventy-five percent of your profit. Yeah, I've been noticing that. Yeah. You really got to do a You've got to do your foreign territories, which foreign is why what sometime in the future we can do that. Territories? What? What are your foreign territories? Seven? They, they're, they're 14. Oh. Wait a minute, my computer. There's like the eight major. And my computer is not cooperating. Asia. Asia. Germany. Asia. Italy. Asia. Got, hang on, I've got the list right here if I can get my computer to cooperate. Come on. Why are you not doing that? Middle East. My mouse is not going over. Oh. Oh. Huh, what is going on? Um, so let's try, try it this way. Let's but foreign, you can make a lot of that. Yeah, you've foreign. got the UK, Germany, Italy. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, if, if you want your mouse to work, you have to work with Disney. Right? Yeah, exactly. Ah. Yeah. The mouse is a rat. Everybody knows that. <laughs> the mouse is a rat. Okay, you've got the U.S., China, Japan, U.K., India, France, Germany, 
Spain, Australia, South Korea, or Southeast Asia, Italy, Mexico, Russia, and Brazil. Those are your 14 big foreign territories. And then within those territories, uh, you know, you've got, they'll, they'll do smaller, you know. We only want to do this in Guadalajara or whatever, you know. Uh, and so you've got that. But these are your big territories that are represented at all of your film festivals and at AFM and, and your big studios, your U.S. distributor, will have contacts with just about every one of them. They might distribute there directly themselves, but they know the key distributors there. And so... When you go to these foreign markets, what are they looking for? They're looking for films that they know will sell in their territory. So if they look at you and go, I'm sorry, this is France. Romantic comedies do <coughs> not do well in France, which never makes sense to me, because it's the city of Les Paris, it's the city of romance. But, you know, you take a romantic comedy to France, uh, to, to the booth that represents the distributors in France, they're going to laugh at you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, that's just not going to do well here. Okay, great. We'll go next door and we'll talk to Italy. They do well in Italy. Now, what sometimes happens with your foreign territories, a lot of people in the U.S., unless they're return Mormon missionaries, forget how small Europe is. It's like going from Nevada to Utah to go from France to Italy. I mean, we were filming in France one time, and one of the U.S. crew members, I can't, it was so funny, he started craving Italian food. You cannot <laughs> find a good Italian restaurant in France. Right. You know, He wanted it. And one of the crew members looked at him and went, you know Italy's a 40-minute drive away. <laughs> <laughs> and we looked at each other and went, it is. Huh? So Saturday, we <laughs> drove over to Italy, and we pigged out, and then we drove back to France, you know. Wow. So it might be doing really good in Italy, and they start talking about it in France, and all of a sudden you've got an audience in France that's going, why isn't that being shown here? And your French distributors will contact your sales agents and go, we do want to release that here now. Word of mouth is, is coming across the border and everybody wants to see it. So you could get foreign territories later on that initially you know better than to a approach because it's literally I, you know, like going from state to state in Europe, going from country to country. And we forget that here because the U.S. is so big. It's an you know, eight-hour drive to get to Canada um, or whatever. And so we don't think that small. Now, are there some things that, if you were to have them in your script, I mean genuinely so, intrinsic, not just thrown in, yeah. um, that uh, could make it more friendly for certain territories? For example, yeah. mixed martial arts will play really well here and here and here, and not so much over there. But yeah. if we have some character that has mixed martial arts, that just adds to That just adds interest. to it. Okay. They know they can sell it. And they've got theaters that they have to, you know, have films in. You know, you, you go to a movie complex in, in Paris, it's like here. You got nine theaters playing. They got to fill that. And they can't fill that with just French films. And so that's why they're so... And guys, the world is getting so small. This is my favorite story to tell about the world's getting so small. We did a film in Uzbekistan. It was a Wes Craven film. It was a John Carpenter film. Anyway, the Dracula film. And we were over there, and, and I told, I told yeah, the class, we, um, we were getting to the end, and the guys on the crew heard about this great two-week trip. You've got to carry two duffel bags in two VW buses that went across Mongolia, the steps of Mongolia, over to the Great Wall of China. Then you flew to Peking, and then you flew to Hong Kong, and then you flew home to L.A. And it was like dirt cheap. I kid you not, it was like four or five hundred bucks. And so a bunch of the crew decided they wanted to do this. On the, that was how they were going to get home to L.A. My idea of roughing it is my five-star hotel room looks out over the parking lot. You know, I was not going to go. In a duffel bag for two weeks with these guys. In, in, no, uh -uh, no, never. So they went on this amazing trip. They got back, and Kim, one of my friends, the technical art director, he and I went to dinner, and he showed me all these pictures he'd taken of this trip. Made me wish I'd gone. I mean, it was just amazing. We need to go. Yeah, we need to go on this trip. So they were going across the steppes of Mongolia, and you have the nomadic Mongolian tribes in those little round tents, 
Yes. that literally follow the grass across the steppes of Mongolia with their camels and their horses. And so he's got this one shot of this 13, 14 year old boy sitting on the back of the horse and he's wearing a Magic Johnson Lakers <laughs> tank top <laughs> and grinning at the camera. And I said, so who sold him their, their t-shirt? Because you guys didn't have a lot of money with you. How much did he pay? And he goes, no, that was his. Mm. And I said, wait, that was, that was his? And he goes, Every one of these tents have satellite and Wi-Fi. Wow. Get out of town. No, they don't. And so he had a picture of the inside of one of these tents, and there was a laptop, and there was a television, and there was the, the, the satellite, and, there, you know, and he said, they found out we were from you know, L.A., and we made movies, and they all wanted to know who we had met, and who we met with, and this was their favorite film, and did they work on this film, out in the middle of a tent in the steppes of Mongolia. <laughs> Okay, so the world is getting really small, and the world loves U.S. entertainment. Yeah. One, you, the, you know the biggest foreign territory distribution area for the Monuments Men? China. Number one, because they couldn't believe we gave the art back, and they wanted to see the movie. But the largest foreign territory monies on the Monuments Men was China, of all odd places. So you, you know. They love U.S. entertainment. They love U.S. actors. They love U.S. stories. And so these foreign territories have to fill their movie theaters just like Cinemax does. These just like AMC. These foreign theaters are going to handle the, the streaming and the mm -hmm. entertainment and all of that. Yeah, those, those are all those. You want to negotiate that with that distributor. Yeah. Um, and that's why when you finish negotiating your U.S. territory with Universal, your next question is, Okay, now, let's talk about Australia, let's talk about the UK, let's talk about France, let's talk about Germany, let's talk about China, let's talk about Southeast Asia. Do you have connections there? And nine times out of ten, you're going to get, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do these distributors have to have uh, names? Like, are they going to ask who's in it? Or can you actually do a film with no names that's a really good film? It, y you can do that. There, you know, you've got your script, you've got your breakdown. Nobody, Tom had not heard, of, well he knew me because we were friends, but he had not heard of my production company nor read Inauguration until I sent him that package that you saw last time I was here. And uh, like I told you, he, his agent got it on Tuesday. On Wednesday I had an email where the first two paragraphs were how amazing our information was. And the first line of the third paragraph was, oh, and it was a great script. But we had all of the information that gave us power that said we know what we're doing and our assumptions show this is going to make money and this is going to be a benefit. And Tom loved the script. But his agents, WME and, um, and uh, Christian Hodel, they didn't know us from Adam's off hind ox. And we didn't go through Tom and Tom did not tell them he knew me. We wanted this to be totally legit. But they loved the script and they loved the green light analysis. Well, you, but you did have some name actors at the end. No. No. Uh, no. Tom was the first person we approached. Oh, I thought in the package you gave us. Those well, were who we were going to. Who were going, we had just attached Tom and we're moving forward. We got the development money and then COVID shut everything down. So that money. Those are the ones you were going. Yeah, to. those are the ones we're going to approach. That yeah. money right now is sitting in escrow, waiting for Tom's schedule to straighten out. Um, but yeah, and you know we have our list of favorite directors. The list of directors I gave Tom does not have Kenneth Branagh's name on it. And both my partners looked at me and said, "No, no, 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 no. We want Kenneth Branagh." And I said, "Yeah, but Tom's coming on as producer as well." And one of his best friends is Kenneth Branagh. And I can absolutely guarantee that one of his first comments is going to be, why don't we contact Ken? And my reaction is going to be, that's brilliant. I didn't think of that. Oh. And Ken and looked at Ken and looked like a man went, you know he's going to see through you. And I said, yeah, it'll take about 10 minutes to see through me. But the idea came from the other producer. Not my like, And they both looked at me and went, oh, you're such a jerk. <laughs> so you know. Yeah. So that was the, you know. And how, are, how do you think streaming sites like Netflix or maybe even uh, uh, Disney or Amazon that's producing their own movies, how are they doing in terms of 
replacing the theatrical release. They're doing they're really, out really out well. Are, are they getting it out? Yeah, they're getting them out there. I mean, partly it's marketing. You go on Amazon and the first line of yeah. movies is, all their is movies. you know, produced by or however they phrase it, so you see them immediately. But yet, yeah, because they're getting Hollywood power. I mean, Martin Scorsese, every studio turned him down. Netflix said, are you sure that's the budget? We can give you more. You know? No. So, um, so it's, they're really building. They, they're, they're now getting big connections, and because of COVID and the movie theaters closing down, it's really changed the game, and we don't know what it's going to do to the numbers. I mean, we know box office numbers are going down and streaming numbers are going up, but it, it still has to plateau and play itself out. We don't know what it's doing, but, you know, you... It, because I showed you. I showed that the theatrical that release is a, a dead sinker. It's I mean, a, yeah, it is. You're losing stuff, but the advertisement counts. So the question is, is can you create that? Yeah, and in the past, online? prior uh, two years ago, I would have said yes. Yeah. Now the game's changed. I don't know. I mean, I showed Dad Greyhound the other night. Uh, Tom Hanks' new film on, yeah, on Amazon. Apple TV, on Apple TV. Freaking. It's on Apple. It's on. It's Apple. That's it. It's yeah. on Apple. Brilliant. It is so good. Yeah, it's good. And it was a strong budget, and it's had strong play and strong showing. And I, we were halfway through, and Dad looked at me, and he's like, "How much longer is this? I'm exhausted." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it does. It starts out, you just keeps going. It just keeps it going. It's called Greyhound. Greyhound. Greyhound yes. It's a World it's War only, Two. Uh, and it's only on Apple. It's only on Apple. He's he is the the captain on. Um, the ship called Greyhound. Yeah, uh, yeah on, on one of the ships that guarded convoys from America to Britain. Take the atomic to take. weapon. And, and uh -huh. so they have to take, they've got, you know, this convoy of about seven, eight ships that are carrying troops and supplies <coughs> to the war, and you have like six of these smaller boats that are guarding the convoy. His boat is head of the boats guarding the convoy, and they run into u boats And the whole movie is 24 hours when they when they run into when they come into contact with the enemy, and it is brilliant. But make sure a you don't eat before because you do get a little seasick, <laughs> and it is it is so high adrenaline you finish the film just exhausted. So how did they make their money? Because it's 50 million dollar budget. Yeah, it was. I was going to say it was 40 or 50 million because of the streaming fees. Amazon is not hurting when it comes to the streaming fees or Prime. <coughs> Apple isn't. Apple. So yeah, so that's so where you. So it's subscription. It's subscription. Okay. <coughs> and you know, I I have a subscription to Apple TV, but I think I also had to pay seven dollars to see it. I think I had to pay a fee on it on that film as well. Okay. Unlike Mulan. <laughs> yeah, uh, which was thirty bucks or whatever. Thirty bucks for Mulan. Um, Temporary. I didn't even like the cartoon. I'm not going to pay to see the line. So what was the strategy? I was there when we did move on. On a, on a Greyhound, fifty million dollar budget. What's the strategy? Because it goes to it goes to Apple. Yeah. And they're not going to get fifty million from Apple. Yeah. They're doing they're in it's in house million? production. Oh, it's an in house production. Yeah. So they're paying for it. Um, so the Irishman was an in house production. They I, was it Amazon like three years ago, but for how many billions of dollars land down in Arizona to build a studio and land up in Ontario. Uh, I think it was Amazon that did that. So they are doing these in-house... In I mean, uh, somebody was telling me Amazon was ta taking literally non-stop pitches Wednesdays and Thursdays. Non-stop pitches? Yeah, pitches. I mean, pitches. 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 Oh, so pitch. they start accept taking pitches at 8 o'clock, and every 30 minutes, somebody else comes in and pitches them a new idea or a new script. Is that yeah. Amazon? I think it was Amazon. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Amazon. <coughs> right. And so somehow they're, they're advertising. Was just put it featuring that this movie is yeah. coming, or... Yeah. Th it's a in studio production, you know, Amazon production, in-house mm -hmm. production, however they phrase it. And uh, I watch a lot of them. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, is a lot of the theatrical advertisement really just uh, tr uh, trailers, the pre-show kind mm -hmm, of thing? Mm -hmm. Is that a lot of it? Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I knew yeah, about Greyhound. Be like I kept waiting for Greyhound to become available because I really wanted to see it because I'd watched the trailer so many times. Yeah. And I loved Tom Hanks couldn't phone in a bad performance, so I knew it was going to be good. Um, I just, and, and like I was saying, uh, Hunter Killer, that sat on his desk for 10 mm -hmm. years because there wasn't, a, there wasn't a, you know, a submarine film. Well, this was a U-boat submarine German-American conflict film. Uh, obviously, there's a market out there for it now. Tom wrote it. Yeah. Tom who? Tom, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. He stars in wrote it. It is so it good. It. It's really, really good. But, you know, the COVID for all COVID has been, you know, a global disaster. It has, in a lot of respects, been a blessing as well. I mean, so how can we take advantage right. of You know, I, I, I had some students last year that um, were doing uh, a 20-minute short, and he's really, really good at what he was doing. There you go. Um, and uh, I lo I, I, he told me the other day, I looked at him and I said, if you turn that into a, a full-length script, which they wanted to do after they did the short, I said, I would pitch that to Netflix and Amazon. And they turned <coughs> it into a full-length script, and he, this, he's still a student, a producing student. He and his friend pitched it to Netflix, and they're very close to closing a deal with Netflix. Because they had a good script. And he said, who do we pitch? And I said, well, I don't know. Let's Google head of distribution at Netflix. <laughs> oh, it's Jane Doe. Here's her contact. Give her a call. And he went, oh. <laughs> oh. That is easy. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and he, he had a 20-minute short to show. Yeah, well, they hadn't even done that yet. Oh, they, they, could, they, they, t they changed the script to a, from a 20-minute script to a, a full feature. Oh. And um, he w came by my office a week and a half ago to catch me up on it and I wasn't there. I was uh, at home and so he, he sent me this big long email. But, you know, he just picked up the phone and called and said, I have something I want to pitch. Who do I talk to? Who do I set an appointment with? Mm -hmm. Now Netflix isn't going to pay like $30 million to a new kid. No, I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure what budget <coughs> or, or what, what deal points they contacted them about. but. The fact is, this kid had the moxie to pick up the phone and call him and ask, and and that's what it takes. And so, who knows what they'll ultimately do? But the real important thing now also is, even if it doesn't go forward, he now has a contact at Netflix. Who knows his name? And you can't put a price tag on that. So it's you know. Here's a question. The. Uh, uh, <coughs> When, when, now. Yeah. When, uh, when a country uh, builds new theaters, for example, they don't put in old projectors and all yeah, that. They put in the latest. So yeah. uh, five years ago, somebody was telling me that, that uh, the previous year in China there had been 500 new theaters built. Yeah, yeah I read that all article. Of them, yeah, all of them put in 4K projectors. And that meant that all of the distributors that would do anything in China wanted 4K uh, release uh, DCPs. Yeah. And if you didn't shoot it and post it and everything in 4K, uh, they were not interested. Yeah. yeah. So, so are there any other? Uh, that's obviously now old. Yeah. But are there any trends you're seeing that might give us an edge in some element? No, I I would just that's <coughs> that's the kind of question you're asked your distributor. When you when you contact Paramount or Disney or whatever, um, could that be in your DDEs as well? Yeah, yeah. And so I mean, you've got a number of, of companies in LA. IO Films, one of them I know him because a friend of mine's in there. He was a member of my ward. Um, that transfers, you know, that that will transfer it to 4K or whatever. Um, and so you've got a number of companies in LA that you can pay to do that. It would be considered a <coughs> distribution expense, a DDE. Um, but when I first, when you first approach and you're you're talking about I'm delivering this on such and such a date, my question would be, what do you want me to deliver to you? I mean, are things changing? Uh, I want to make sure you get what you can release, and they will have a specific list of this, this, that, and the other thing. Are you are you seeing any other trends or things that? I mean, this is hard to guess, but yeah. anything in, in that's kind of moving toward a certain direction. 
Uh, no, right now oh. what I see happening is is the compression abilities to transfer information are getting bigger and better, but I don't see what they're transferring changing that much. Okay. But that's just me. I don't know. I'm, my my area of expertise is not post production. Well, I think your green light process will identify a lot of that trend mm -hmm. as far as content. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, the seven to eight year period and what, you know, is now going to be, you know, new material for people. Yeah. Something yeah. they're looking for. It'll do content. Uh, what quality or deliverability of the content doesn't reflect in the green light. That would be a conversation with your distributor. Mm -hmm. Are things changing? Do, do, how do you want us to deliver this to you? Yeah. What's the earliest stage at which you should go see a distributor? As soon as you have development funding. As soon as your development is funded, you want to start talking to your distributor. So do you have to have a completed script? Or uh, yeah, I mean, you, what you would do is you make sure you have the option on it, you have the rights to it. Um, you have, I, even if I was adapting a book, I'd have the script first. Because you can't really do the correct green light analysis without the script. Because, uh, you know, you get, that, you get that development funding, you've got the script, you do the analysis, now I have the ammunition for the gun when I go and talk to the distributor. And a treatment wouldn't uh, do it? Uh, you can't do a real thorough... It, it's too as easy as you're writing the, the script from the treatment to make changes and fix this and, oh, I've got this great idea, what if we did that? Yeah. The Not green bad. light was on this story. Yeah. You ended up with this story. <coughs> now I got to do another whole green light, yeah. and maybe you know again. You have to have it by the beats. Yeah, yeah, because you, you're doing it. You're doing the analysis by the beats in there, and and you've got that script because this is the movie I am contracting to de de to deliver to you, yeah. not this rewrite. Yeah. It was this. So, you know, they, they want to make sure you're legitimate and you've got that ready to go. That's why there was just one scene that Liz had to fix in inauguration when we sent it to Tom, and it literally was a page in there that said something to the effect of, we have to figure out how he gives this information to the president and we'll write this in. <laughs> it was something that affected just cracked me up when I read it. I thought, what? And then we figured out where it went. It went somewhere else and it fixed the problem. But that was the only thing in the script that, that she had not fully fleshed out. And I'm proud to say that the idea of how to fully flesh that out was mine. Uh, the only part I had in the story. But, um, yeah, so I would say, you, yeah, you, that script, because that's what you do the green light analysis off of. And those analysis are the assumption numbers that you're building everything else on. I would not want to go in to talk to a distributor without those assum assumed numbers. You're flying blind. I mean, you're just completely flying blind. You're back to, this is Star Trek meets Harry Potter, you know, um, because you, knowing those numbers in advance just gives you so much ammunition when you're talking to them. That's why those guys, those agents, love those numbers. What if somebody's going to Netflix with a piece Well, I, I would still do the, the I would the still do the analysis the same way, because yeah. one of the things they're arguing about right now is, you know, for the Oscars, these Netflix and Amazon shows, do they have to have a box office release to be considered? They, knowing the Academy and how inherently stupid they are. I can see them sticking to their guns and saying, no, it has to have a box office release if you want us to consider your films. And so Netflix and, and Amazon and those guys are already talking about how do we do box office releases. Even just one week in LA? Yeah, it only has to be one week. It's a low hurdle. A low, a low yeah. hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. But they might find out that's another, uh, another um, uh, income stream. Amazon Theater. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here, so the theaters are coming available. <laughs> yeah, you know, and they'll do the same thing, you know, with Cinemark that the, your U.S. distributors do. They'll contact them, do a contract. This is, uh, you know, the distribution fee. Let's license this for this amount, this amount of screens. Yeah, they'll do the same thing mm -hmm. 
that your studios do. I have a Amazon. I'd buy the legal fees. I know. That's what I was thinking, yeah. too. Yeah. The they, they should step in. And, and if people are going to pay, some people might prefer to go there and pay $7. Some people might want to stream it. I make the same either way, except I have overhead with the theater. But not that much. Uh, the, the, the fee with working with a, a, distri- you know, a movie theater, oddly enough, is not nearly as high as you think it is. Which is why you can go and ask for your money back. Well, did back. you have a slide that said one million for two two thousand something yeah, theaters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so whatever the fee was. So, oh. I, I, yeah, and and if Regal's going to sell off a bunch of theirs, you've already got them built, yeah. and all the accoutrements in there. You've already got everything you need. Yeah. Um, so call Jim Bezos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm available to head that department. Should I send you my resume? Yeah. Would it, so. uh, would it make sense to hire an agent to help you negotiate your distribution deal? Yeah, you're foreign. You want that. Pre- you want that sales agent. Those sales agents can also help you with your U.S. deals. Okay. And that, that's like they do. Yeah. yeah. You wasn't charging that much. No. It's your fee. One yeah. seventy-seven, yeah. any, any last questions here, quickly? We can, we can have twelve of these and not run out of questions. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is terrific. Terry. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you.